Welcome into the studio for a bit of filament questions and answers. Mrs. LM is here. Hello. And she has a list of questions from our Twitch and YouTube communities. She's going to ask them. I'm going to answer them. And hopefully, it's all going to make us better printers. Today's episode is generously sponsored by Polymaker, the world's largest manufacturer of 3D printing filament. They provide all the filament for our Twitch channel and our YouTube channel, and we are very grateful for it. I'll have their link on the screen and in the description below. Go check it out. Thank you, Polymaker. First up is PLA, polylactic acid, the most common 3D printing uh, filament in the 3D printing industry. So Mrs. LM, what are the first questions? First one is how should PLA be stored? So people look at the wall behind me, I mean, and they no doubt see that there's a lot of filament just sitting out on those shelves. It is hydroscopic, don't get me wrong, but if I was to put it on a scale of one to 10, I would probably say it's around a three. It does absorb moisture, but we, we're on a mountain uh, with relatively low humidity, so it's not a problem for us. If you live near a large body of water or in a very you know high humidity area, you may have to dry it. That's not very common. How do you store it? I store mine out in the open. A lot of people store theirs in, in bins and bags, but uh, just remember, it's really not as hygroscopic as, uh, as a lot of people uh, tend to believe. All right, what's the next question? What is a good price for PLA? Because sometimes I see on Amazon something as low as $8. PLA filament ranges from about 10 to about $30. If you get over 30 into 35 into $40 for PLA, that's usually a more boutique filament that's kind of expensive. Um, if you get under $12, $15 a spool, you're kind of getting into a, a danger zone where the filament's going to be so inexpensive that you might tend to have quality issues. So there can be in filament, there can be problems where as the filament's extruded, you can have uh, thin spots and then you can have thick spots. And it's really those thick spots that can cause jams in 3D printers and, and cause clogs. When you get to the lower price point in filament, you know, under that under that $12 spool, $10 spool, that's where you're more likely to have those problems. And I think on Amazon, when I see a spool of filament that's $8, that's too inexpensive. So I, I would just be wary. Is PLA safe to print? Okay, that's a good one. Okay, interesting. Is it safe to print like as in like, is it toxic to print? Yes. Oh, okay, got it, got it, got it. I don't recommend, I mean, you can have a 3D printer in your bedroom, that's fine. If you're going to print things like PLAs, that's fine. Um, I think that you should have ventilation. Uh, you need to have an open window. You have to have a large enough room where there's fresh air coming in, in and out, especially if it's in a if it's in a place where you sleep. Only print PLAs, maybe even PTGs in there, but always have fresh air and ventilation. Um, PLA uh, hasn't, hasn't been proven to have uh, any negative health impacts or effects that we are aware of. So I think if you're printing PLAs, you're going to be fine. Um, as long as, like I said, as long as you have fresh air, it's not going to be like uh, like any of the other toxic filaments or filaments with uh, you know harmful VOCs like ABSs and ASAs, things like that. But no, it, it is a it is a relatively safe filament, and uh, matter of fact, there's an awful lot of it that gets printed in our house. Oh, that's a good question, Miss Stella. All right, what's next? Mm, I see a lot of colors for PLA and a lot of different options. What is exactly the difference between PLAs? PLA Pros or oh. PLA Pluses? Okay, so that's a good question. We get that question a lot on the show. And what is the difference basically between a PLA and a PLA Pro? And some of the companies have their PLA Pluses or HD PLAs, HT PLAs, things like that. Usually what that means is that there's additives. The additives help it to be a little bit more flexible or a little bit more characteristic of PTG. So it won't be as brittle. Um, it'll be a little bit more impact resistant, things like that. So that's your primary difference between uh, PLA and a PLA Pro. And I would say if you have the chance, experience a PLA Pro, experience a PLA Plus, and I think that you're, uh, you will have a better overall 3D printing experience if you're printing with PLA Pros and PLA Pluses. It, it, you're just going to find it's, it'll print just as well, if not better, and your results will be a little bit uh, better quality. That's a good question. Okay, what's next? I print a lot. Are PLA prints recyclable? Oh, oh, the recycle. You would think, right? PLA is a bioplastic, so it's a derivative of corn uh, and sugarcane and other things like that. So you would naturally think that it would be recyclable, but the truth is it's not because it can't be heated and cooled and heated and cooled and recycled and reused. So unfortunately, um, it's one of those things where you print with PLA, it's gonna end up in the trash, um, it's gonna end up in the landfill. Now the good news is, is it's, it's renewable, right? I mean, ultimately renewable, right? We can grow corn and uh, in, in sugar cane. Oh, and it does biodegrade. Now it's not as biodegradable as some people think it is or want it to be. If you threw it in your compost pile out in your backyard, 
you're probably not going to see it break down within a year or two. It's going to be much longer than that. Industrial composting, yes, but no, not your backyard. But the good news about that is, is it doesn't matter. You can smash it up. You can put it in the trash. It's going to go off to a landfill. And in that landfill in the next five to 10 years, um, it'll completely break down and be gone. So PLA ultimately is biodegradable, um, but it is not recyclable. So most recycling places won't even touch it. They won't take it. That's a good one. That's a really good question. So that's it. Is that the last question for PLA? No, actually, there is one more. Oh, people are concerned about abrasive filaments glow okay. into dark oh. and even some say polyterra okay well that's okay so polyterra does have minerals in it so i could see that so okay so abrasive filaments so that would be uh, glow in the dark wood fill carbon fiber um polyterra things like that but yes abrasive plas are going to wear down a brass nozzle so you're going to have to print with like a hardened steel nozzle or some type of a special nozzle like a like for instance a slice engineering's gamma master nozzle things like that yes glow in the darks they are abrasive and it really depends on the brand sometimes you can get away with printing spools and spools of glow in the dark filament in a brass nozzle other times you print one spool or even get through a half a spool of glow in the dark filament on a brass nozzle and you've already blown out the nozzle completely so um, it really depends on the brass nozzle or the type of nozzle you're running and the in the in the brand of filament now as far as polyterra polyterra is a line of filament from polymaker our sponsor up there it is 25 percent mineral by weight which is actually really fantastic so during the pla shortage a few years ago the r d team from polymaker created a new recipe for pla and they called it polyterra and it's 25% mineral, and they do something actually fantastic where every spool of polyterra filament that's sold, they plant a tree, wow. which is really cool. So not only do you have this renewable bioplastic that's made from corn and sugarcane, but you also have it on cardboard spools, and you also have it being made 25% by weight from minerals from the earth. So it, uh, it's a fantastic PLA, gorgeous matte finish, and uh, it's something, if you haven't tried it, you should. I think it's reasonably priced. And, well, they plant a tree every time you buy a spool of it. So, yeah, give it a shot. That's a great question. Is that it? Last yep. one? All right, that's the last question for PLA. Let's move on. Now we have PETG. So PETG stands for, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat and I'm going to read it. Uh, PETG stands for polyethylene terephthalate glycol. And in the stages of 3D printing, people start with PLA and then they graduate that and they move into PETG. It's like the next step up, but it can be a little bit more difficult to print. This, this will be interesting to find out what questions we have about PETG. But go ahead, Ms. Dillon, what do you got? The obvious one, what is the main difference between PETG and PLA? The main differences are that it's going to require a little bit more heat. So you're going to be around 220, uh, 230, up to 240 to 250 C on the nozzle. Um, it's extremely sticky. Um, it's going to stick to the nozzle. It's going to stick to the heater block. One thing that people don't know about PTG that I think that they, well, at least they overlooked that, PTG is UV resistant. So if you're thinking about printing things for your garden, um, a lot of people are printing PLAs. Uh, but in fact, if they were to print PETGs, yeah, they're, they're going to fare quite a bit better because um, PETGs are, I can't say naturally UV resistant, but uh, PETGs are UV resistant. And I think a lot of people miss that. PETGs are gorgeous. Um, they also have uh, a lot of different colors, right? So the colors are bright and vibrant. Uh, PTG is translucent. So as you can see right there, uh, I'm kind of turning that with the lights there. They, they just shine and they reflect so beautifully. Um, Let's see, what else? Price-wise, is PETG cheaper or more expensive than PLA? It's about the same. Um, you're you're going to find that PETG is going to be somewhere around probably $15 to $30 a spool. If you're trying to buy a spool of PETG and it's over $30 a spool, that better be a pretty special PETG. But, uh, yeah, about $15 to $30 is, is fair. And there are some really amazing colors uh, that are out there in PETG. So I really recommend that people go give it a shot. Today's printers, today's slicers and profiles, they make it a heck of a lot easier. So yeah, definitely give PETG a shot. Don't be afraid of it. What else? What's another one? Is PETG food safe? Uh, because I want to make things like cookie cutters. I knew this one was coming. So this, so I knew this question was going to come because this is a question that comes up all of the time. I mean, it is food safe as far as, yeah, could you eat off of it? Absolutely. Could you reuse it, rewash it? Uh, that becomes the tech, the technical problem there, um, because there are going to be micro cracks whenever you 3D print, and there's little places for uh, bacteria to get in and, and grab hold and grow. One time use, like a cookie cutter that you're going to print, one time use, dispose of it. Um, I think that that's that's absolutely fine. But prolonged use, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend it just because of 3D printing the nature of the layer lines and the micro 
uh, cracks in, in, in places for bacteria to, to grab hold of. What's another one? You talked about PETG being too sticky. Mm -hmm. How do I get it off my bill plate? How do okay. I make sure that it's not everywhere okay. on my printer? PETG is very sticky. So PETG is, uh, it is most commonly found in soda bottles. There's some sports equipment. PETG is in the bubble packaging that we get when we buy products. It's also in electronics. If you're printing on a glass build plate, you're gonna have to put an interface layer down like a, like a glue stick or something like that um, to ultimately keep it from sticking too much to it to the point to where you try and remove it, it'll shatter the glass. But there is something that's interesting, and I haven't tried this yet, but this was sent over to us from Slice Engineering, and this is called their PRP. It stands for Plastic Repellent Paint. And this is, it's a basically it's a PTFE liquid, and you apply it with a little brush on the nozzle and on your heater block, and it just repels any of the plastic that we print. So it would, uh, no matter where the PTG sticks, it would just peel off and then you can just reapply a little uh, PRP, it would be just fine. So in place of a sock on your hunting. So, is that good? All right. Does PETG absorb moisture? Yes. So PETG does absorb moisture. Um, it, it's going to absorb moisture more than PLA. I'd say on a scale of one to 10, I'd say that PETG is gonna be about a four or a five as far as hygroscopic goes. My first experiences with a filament that absorbed moisture was with PETG on a Prusa Mark 3S. I literally was halfway across the room and I could hear the popping and the sizzling that was coming from the the PTG that absorb moisture. Yes, it definitely does absorb moisture, and it uh, if you want that perfect surface finish with PTG uh, and you know better quality, make sure that you know you're either in a low humidity area um, or you definitely have thrown it in a filament dryer. And we'll have uh, links uh, to like a filament dryer uh, and things like that, maybe even on the screen. Um, but we'll definitely have it in the description below. Fix Dry actually sent us a fantastic filament dryer that we've been using up here, and so I'll, I'll have that in the links or in the description below. Can I recycle PETG print? Recycling PETG, yes and no. PET, very recyclable. The G is kind of what causes the problem sometimes. Not all recycling facilities will take PETG. And so I think it's a fantastic idea to call ahead and ask if they will. Um, if not, they're, they're just gonna put it in the landfill. So if you don't want it to end up in the landfill, then what I would recommend is calling and finding out to make just to make sure that you tell them that it's PTG and these are uh, 3D printed things and ask them, say, are you going to recycle this? Or I mean, are you just going to take it and you're just going to send it off to a landfill? You can ask them that. But that I hope that answers your question. It, it's a yes and a no, really depends on where you're at and what facility you're working with. Is that it? That's it. Okay, perfect. All right. So now we're moving on to, I think, is it ABS? Hey, thanks for watching and I hope you're enjoying our content. We're not done. We still have ABS, ASA, and Nylon to talk about, but we would love to have your like and we'd love to have your subscribe. Helps us out a lot. All right, here we are, ABS. This one is a popular one because ABS is an extremely versatile polymer, but it stands for acrylonitrile butadiene styrene. And Mrs. LM, I bet there's questions about this one because it's a very popular plastic. Like I said, it's very versatile and I think a lot of people want to print with it. There's just a lot of doubt in people's minds when it comes to ABS on whether or not they think they can or can't print it. So what do we have? First one is why would someone choose to print with ABS? Why would someone choose to print with ABS? Well, ABS is, a, like I said, it's a very common polymer. So ABS is going to be in sporting equipments. Our drain waste vent systems in our houses are all ABS. ABS is very common in the injection molding world. So ABS, like I said, it's a very stable plastic. It's a very strong plastic, uh, very flexible. So yeah, I mean, that's why we would want to print with uh, ABS. What else do we have? Do you need to dry it before printing? Yes. So AB ABS, uh, on the level of hygroscopic ranking, as far as my level of 1 to 10, like I said, PLA being about a 3, PETG being about a 4. Um, ABS, I'm going to put it a 5. ABS should be dried. You can throw it in a dryer. It's not going to hurt it. If you're in a low humidity environment up here like me, I don't really dry ABS. Um, I do dry a ASA sometimes, but not really. But I would say that ABS, for the most part, if you want good quality prints, you should, you should keep it dry because it is hygroscopic. And do you need an enclosure to print with it? Ah, Okay, this is an interesting question. Do you have to have an enclosure to print ABS? No. Should you? Mm, yes, likely. ABS is prone to warping. So unless you have an incredible bed adhesive and you're running like a Vision Miner uh, nanopolymer adhesive um, or, or Magigoo, or which actually this stuff's pretty cool, we haven't tried it yet. Um, this was sent over to us by TH3D. This is their bed cement. This is interesting because a lot of the other formulas for bed adhesives, they always have a recipe for 
the specific type of filament or like a group of filaments, right? The different groups of polymers. It is formulated for, and I'll just read it off the bottle, PLA, PETG, ABS, ASA, nylon, polycarbonate, TPU, carbon fiber and glass fiber filled uh, filament. So I think that's, that's kind of interesting. We're actually looking forward to, it's blue. Ooh, that'll wake you up. But yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, offering from TH3D and we'll check it out soon. But, but ultimately ABS does work. If you're printing it outside of an enclosure, you're gonna definitely have to have some sort of a bed adhesive to hold it down to prevent it from warping. I think the best way to print ABS is going to be in a nice warm environment where you can keep the polymer stable while it's printing so it cools evenly, prevents the warp. Sorry for the long-winded answer. But what about VOCs? The S in ABS stands for styrene, and that is toxic uh, to breathe, so you don't want to do that. Um, if you're going to be printing ABS, you're going to want that uh, to be vented to the outside or in a room where there's a lot of uh, like a lot of airflow, ventilation, open window. Um, you're not gonna be wanting to print ABS or ASA or nylons and all those kind of things in uh, sleeping areas, you know, for humans and animals, they breathe too, so be careful of that. Uh, yeah, there is toxins that do come from printing with ABS, and so I would, I would just be wary of that. Can I recycle my ABS prints? ABS is highly recyclable. Um, because it is one of the most common plastics or polymers in the world, a lot of research has been uh, done uh, in into recycling ABS. And I want to say, if, if I remember right, ABS might be one of those ones that's like infinitely recyclable. Like they can just continually recycle it and it goes into new products. And then those you could just recycle and on and on and so forth. Um, so yeah, but definitely recyclable. Yeah, you, any place will take ABS. I already know the next one that's coming. So I'm gonna scroll down here right here. It's gonna be ASA. All right, ASA stands for acrylonitrile styrene acrylate. And it is what I'm going to call the high tech version of ABS. Um, it's new, it's fancy, it's got some benefits uh, to it over ABS. And, and I want to say that, that I really think that people, if you're going to be printing ABS or ASA and you're going to go in that direction, give ASA a try. I think you'll be surprised. But uh, what questions we have? I don't want to give away too much. Well, what, what are the main differences between ABS and ASA? So this is, this is uh, ABS. These two are ABS. And this is an ABS traditional. This is like a pop green color. This is from Polymaker. And we'll have uh, links to this stuff in the description below. And this is a galaxy purple. So this actually has a, uh, a glitter uh, in it. So ABSs are coming quite a long way um, in becoming fancy and bright and fun and lots of options. They used to be boring. They used to be just grays and blacks and whites and blech. But now ABSs, they're becoming really cool. This is ASA. It's just in its foil bag. It's just black. That's what this is. This is a black ASA from Polymaker. The difference between ABS and ASA, is that, I forgot the question. Was Correct. that the question? Okay. Yes. Uh, the difference is, is that it's one, it's more expensive, about probably $5 a spool more expensive on average. Um, and I think that price ranges from about, oh, 30 to 50, maybe about 30 to $50 a spool for ASA. So it, it can get kind of expensive. The main difference, it is UV resistant. So like I said, it's a higher tech version of ABS. Also, they are doing some fun colors with ASA. A handful of years ago, you could get reds, greens, blues, and that was about it. And, and But now we're seeing glitter ASAs and we're seeing all sorts of really fun, bright, bold colors because printers now are making it easier for people to print uh, ASA and the recipes are becoming a lot more stable. So I hope that answered it. Yeah, so can you really get sick from ASA and ABS fumes? Okay, so I get that question a lot and I've told this story an awful lot. ASA poisoning is a real thing. To make this really quick, um, I had ASA poisoning and uh, I was working in uh, the office with a couple of raised 3D printers that were printing ASA and they actually had the, the, the carbon filters in the printers and over a couple of days I started to get headaches, I started to, get, uh, to feel nauseated and I actually felt like it was the flu. I told uh, Mrs. LM that I'm going to go lay down, I didn't quite feel well, uh, a couple hours of sleep in, in a new area, right, new environment with fresh air. I felt better. Upon returning back to the, uh, to the office with those three printers, within, within minutes to a half hour to an hour, I was getting sick again, and I thought, it was, I thought it was the flu. I went laid down again. This went on for about a day or so, um, and on the third or fourth day, I think, that's when I realized something's not right, and it's this room. And uh, I really couldn't smell it anymore, but I was feeling it. Uh, I looked up, ASA poisoning, the symptoms, and it was exactly how I was feeling. And just so you know, ASA poisoning, the styrene loads up in your blood system, and eventually, your body will just switch off, and, uh, and it can be fatal. So be careful, print in a well-ventilated area, even if the printer has a filter, that's not good enough, at least it wasn't for me, and uh, make sure there's fresh air, and uh, yeah, but be careful with that. Definitely don't be printing this around people or animals. 
So an enclosure is not enough. Just because it has an enclosure with a filter, that's not a safety. These printers aren't sealed. So if you were to take a look at this printer right here, there's quarter inch gaps around all the panels on the lid. The air is moving in and out of that printer and not all of the air is going out uh, through that filter. So even though it's pulling fresh air in and blowing it out through that filter, there's still fumes from ASA and ABS escaping. And absolutely, I mean, I was in a room with uh, two or three printers printing uh, ASA and uh, yeah, no, I, I did get sick. So uh, that, that, and this is my honest personal experience. So be very careful with it when you're printing with it. I know it's coming next though, I think. Yeah. You've, you. asked, you've asked it for every single one. I bet it's going to say, is it recyclable? People are very concerned about the plastic they put back in. They want to yeah. know, are my ASA prints recyclable? So, that, so yes, and Mrs. Ellen is right. People want to know. 3D printing creates uh, waste. I'm going to say something controversial here, and that is, is that uh, it doesn't really matter what we print. It doesn't matter if we print these helmets. It doesn't matter if we're printing, you know, little, you know, mini LMs sitting on horses. It's waste. And uh, eventually everything that we that we make as makers and crafters is going to end up in a landfill somewhere. And so we have to be responsible about that. So if we can recycle something so it can be reused and repurposed, then we should. Is ASA recyclable? You want to say yes, but it's really going to come down to the recycling facility and whether or not they want it to be. A lot of places say they'll take it, but then it just ends up in the bins that go off to the landfill. Call and ask if they'll take ASA and then ask specifically after they say, yeah, we'll take it. You say, well, is it being recycled or is it being sent off to landfill? Ask them. Is that it? So next we are moving on to nylon, the last of the filaments that we're going to talk about today. And this is an incredible filament that I wish more people would experience. And I understand it's a little bit more expensive. I know it's harder to print with, but I really wish that people would, would kind of step outside of that PLA, step outside of the PETG, you know, go past ABSs and ASAs and get yourself up to nylon because it is an extremely versatile polymer. So let's hear the questions because I can't imagine there's a whole lot of popular questions about this because not a lot of people print with nylon, but what do, what do you have? Not a lot of questions, but the main one is, is it worth $100? $100? Who's selling nylon for $100? You said 50 to, five, 50 to 100. Oh, 50 to 100. Oh, I was okay. like, oh my gosh. I was like, <laughs> yes, there's a whole $50 range up to 100. I was like, we're going right into the $100 filament. Okay, no. Wow, nylons range from about $50 a kilogram up to about $100 a kilogram. And be careful when you're ordering nylon. You're gonna see nylon for $36. You're gonna see nylon for 30 or 29. Uh, that's not a whole spool. That's a half a spool. Um, that's three quarters of a spool. So it's like 500 grams, 750 grams. So pay attention. When I first started ordering nylon, uh, matter of fact, my first orders from uh, nylon were from Matter Hackers years ago, many years ago. And I remember I ordered a ton of it and I was all excited. And they showed up on these like 500 gram spools. And I'm like, what is this? That effectively doubled the price of all that nylon that I bought. So I was shocked. Yes, nylon is a little bit more expensive, but it is extremely strong and very durable. And it is one of the most common plastics uh, that's in our environment. Is it worth $100? Yes. I mean, because like I said, um, nylon being a little bit more expensive, you'd say $50 or so like that, you know, for three quarters of a spool. 100 that's going to be nylons that are like carbon fiber filled, glass filled, Kevlar filled. So it can be. It depends on the brand and what else. So what do you need to print with nylon? Uh, nylon, you're gonna have to have an enclosure. So nylon warps, it is the king of warping. Also, nylon is highly hygroscopic. On my scale of one to 10, it is an eight or a nine. It sucks up water, it's what it does, it's what it's best at. So warping and sucking up water, that's what nylon does. So uh, it is. that's why it's a lot more challenging to print with. If you're going to print with nylon, you need a printer that has an enclosure and you are going to need bed adhesive. It doesn't matter how you squish down your first layer. It doesn't matter how clean your, your PEI build sheet is. It doesn't matter. You will have to hold down uh, that print with some type of adhesive. Also, you don't want to take the chance. If your spools of filament are 50 to $100 a spool, do you really want to take the chance when you're burning through two, three, four hundred grams of filament that right towards the middle or end that it warps off the bed? No, you don't. So uh, it's definitely uh, something that uh, you should consider. So one of the things that I really have a lot of success with is this nanopolymer adhesive from Vision Miner. And it's got a really fine tip on it. You can't really see it here. I'll see this really fine tip right there. That uh, allows me, when I clean the build plate, I'll take some of that nanopolymer adhesive and I'll put it on there and I'll brush it where, I'm, where I know the print's gonna go. And I let it go, I let it print. Now, when it's printing, that little fine tip on there is perfect for the corners of your prints or those outlying areas 
you can reach over and you can just put a little dab and let that capillary action kind of pull that nanopolar adhesive into the underside of that print right to the bed. Um, and it'll lock down the corners and you will not have a failure. Um, if you're running a surface like BuildTac, which uh, are these uh, the surfaces in these Ray 3D machines, it works so well that if you're not careful when you're trying to remove the print, it'll actually tear the layers of the BuildTac apart. So um, it, it's what we use for polycarbonate. It's what we use for nylon and things like that when we print up here. How about that? What, what's next? Heated chambers. Oh. I want to know, do I need that? You don't have to, line? all right? You need an enclosure um, because of drafts and things like that, but you don't have to have... Uh, a heated enclosure, but it, it should be warm and keep drafts out. I will tell you that the Chidi X Plus 3, which is a printer that we've looked at recently, I, it's one of the most under-recognized features of that printer, is it has an active heated chamber. So there's actually a chamber heater with a fan keeping that environment warm and you can set the temperature in the slicer. And that makes for printing nylons, like that's a game changer. If you don't know anything about that printer, Go check it out. We'll have a link on the screen in the description below. But it's called the Chidi X Plus 3, and they have their Max, which is like a helmet class size enclosed 3D printer. So go, go look at those. And the last question is the recyclable one. So this one for sure. So nylon is 100% recyclable, and it is infinitely recyclable. Nylon is one that you can recycle, and then it'll get pulled back into the manufacturing pipeline, and it'll get processed, and then it'll get put back into products, and so on and so forth. So definitely don't mix your nylon with your ABSs and your PLAs and PTGs, things like that. Keep your nylon prints separate and uh, those can be recycled. So yeah, definitely. Um, and, and we like that. Is that it? That's it. Well, that's fantastic. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Mrs. LM. You're welcome. If you have questions that we didn't get to or we didn't answer, we will be doing a part two on different filaments and we can always go back and, and answer these questions. But put those in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you to our YouTube members. You are what make this content possible. If you'd like to have your name included in every single one of our videos, click the little join button down below. We'd love to have you. Now I'm going to put Mrs. LM on the spot and she's going to read all of the wonderful YouTube members. And there you go. Thank you, JD Davis, Jesse West, Four Pipes, David Washnick, Waste and Time 3, VPS Data, Captain Jarebear91, Sir Will 3D, Joel Finn, Brandon 0109, Cam Nicholas, Luppy Luptonian, the Zinzia, Patrick W3D, Rip Artist, Bree Dog Knight, Citral, Your Buddy Danek, Buddha 3D, and Jedi Spidey. All right, thank you. We'll see you on the next one. Thanks, Mr. Bye. Dylan.